In this video on acid-base equilibrium, we're going to start by answering the question, why would you want to study acid-base chemistry? And next, we're going to move into the definitions of acids and bases and how they are related to one another. And we're also going to talk about what reactions they can undergo. So there are reactions where you dissolve an acid in water or a base in water, or you directly react an acid with the base. And like with all equilibrium topics, we're also interested in understanding how far do these reactions go or how far to completion. And for most of these acid-base reactions, they generally all involve the transfer of a proton or an H plus ion. And regarding how far the reactions go, this is often indicated by two types of reaction arrows. If the acid or base is strong, then typically these reactions will go to completion, and so we would use this right-handed arrow. But if they are weak, oftentimes what they set up is a nice equilibrium as represented by our equilibrium arrow. One of the reasons we might want to study acids and bases is because they are found in the building blocks of life. So in this image where we have a cell and we zoom into the nucleus, and here are the genes or the chromosome, and as we get into the more detailed structure, we see the beautiful double helix, and we can see that the double helix is being held together by hydrogen bonds between these ring structures. And these are called the DNA bases. So as an example, this yellow ring structure here is actually this molecule composed of carbon, nitrogen, and protons. And it's called adenine. And it's basically one of the DNA bases. Fatty acids, so they are acidic, are found in the cell membrane or the lipid bilayer and also amino acids, which are found in proteins, also have an acidic group and an amino group that's basic. So part of being a chemist is being able to recognize what is an acid and what is a base. And in nature, a very common base is this nitrogen where there's three groups attached. So you can find that in adenine, and you can find that inside the amino acid. Now, in fatty acids and also amino acids, this group is called a carboxylic acid. It's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen attached to an OH. And this is, again, another common acidic group found in nature. So being able to recognize acids and bases also helps you to understand um, how they react and function in nature. So one cool thing about amino acids is that they have both a basic and an acidic group. And so you can do an internal proton transfer where the acidic proton moves to the base. This is well known to happen Basically, base and acids can react by a proton transfer. And here, the proton moves to the base, leaving a minus charge on the oxygen. And when the proton moves to the nitrogen, it goes from a neutral charge to a positive charge. So single amino acids are actually zwitter ionic, meaning they have this split ion charge on both ends of the molecule. Historically, the definitions of acids and bases have evolved. The first important definitions of acids and bases were proposed by Arrhenius, which you might recognize from the Arrhenius equation. He proposed that an acid has an ionizable H atom, meaning that it can be released as a proton, H+, to water, and the proton and water form H3O+, which is called the hydronium ion. A base, on the other hand, has an ionizable OH group, meaning it can release 
OH minus or hydroxide in water. The next set of an important definition are called the Bronsted-Lowry acid base definitions. In this set of definition, an acid is redefined as a proton donor, something that has an ionizable H atom, meaning it can be released as a proton. And there's just a subtle difference from Arrhenius in that it's not restricted to water as a solvent. But in water, it would also follow the Arrhenius definition in that it would also make hydronium. But it doesn't have to be in water. Now, the base definition is much more different. Here, a base is simply a proton acceptor, in some ways opposite to an acid, which is a proton donor. And the way a base acts as a proton acceptor is that it must have a lone pair of electrons, um, basically to take up the proton. So when the proton gets transferred to the base, it's really looking for this lone pair of electrons to attach to. These two definitions are different in that the Arrhenius is solvent-centric, and that solvent was water. In Bronsted-Lowry, you can think of this as being proton-centric, because an acid is a proton donor, but a base is a proton acceptor. Now there's a third set of definitions which appears in section 18.9. This isn't required, but for completeness, I'll just present it. Here, an acid is redefined as a electron or lone pair acceptor. So it no longer has to be a proton, but just something that has an empty orbital. Now, protons are basically an empty 1s orbital. So a proton also fits this definition of a Lewis acid. Now, the base is simply just what the Bronsted-Lowry base definition was in that it has to have a lone pair of electrons. So here, the Lewis acid base definitions are lone pair centric in that the base now is an electron donor but the acid is an electron or lone pair acceptor. Next, we're going to delve into the Arrhenius acids and bases by giving some concrete examples and also showing some acid-base reactions that they can undergo. So an Arrhenius acid has an ionizable proton shown here in red, and these are some examples given here. I'm going to first focus on hydrogen chloride, or HCl. HCl is a strong acid, and when you dissolve in water, it fully dissociates, meaning that the HCl completely separate from each other, and the proton reacts with water to form the hydronium ion, leaving the chloride anion behind as a secondary product. So what makes this a reaction example of a strong acid is that it strongly favors the products. And so the reaction arrow here is just drawn as a right-handed arrow. Visually, what that means is if you start with an intact HCl molecule and you add it to water, all those molecules will fully dissociate into their ions. So here we have the chloride ion and the proton ion which is then bound to water. So this is full dissociation where there is no intact HCl left. In this class, it's going to be important to be able to recognize what is a strong acid. So I'd like to give you some guidelines. First, we'll start with hydrohalic acids, where the proton is bound to a halide atom. Most of these are strong acids. So X can be chloride, bromide, or iodide. The only exception is fluoride. Because fluoride is so electronegative, it holds on to the proton too tightly. And so HF is actually a weak acid. Another group of strong acids have this formula where there's a central atom named E surrounded by oxygen 
and some of those oxygens have protons attached. These are called oxoacids. And for an oxoacid to be a strong acid, you have to have the number of oxygen atoms outnumber the number of protons by two or more. So a good example of this could be H2SO4 or HClO4 or HNO3. So here, sulfur, chloride, and nitrogen are this uh, generic E atom. In the list up here, you'll notice that these are carboxylic acids, uh, the COOH group, and they are not part of the definition for strong acid. And that's because carboxylic acids are weak acids. So let's talk about what weak acids do in water. Well, like strong acids, weak acids also have an ionizable proton that they can transfer to water uh, to make H3O+, leaving behind the resulting anion. What makes this a weak acid reaction is that this is now an equilibrium that actually favors the reactants. So weak acids um, do not readily dissociate and their equilibrium constants are often much smaller than one. So visually what happens is you might start with an intact weak acid and as you dissolve it in water, most of that sample will actually stay intact in water and just a few will dissociate into their ions where the protons are now bound to water and the remaining anion is also dissolved in solution. So characteristic of weak acids is that there's actually very little dissociation. It's also important to recognize what a weak acid is. Um, and there's many more weak acids than there are strong acids. So let's start with the simpler ones like HF. And I also put HCN here because CN is often considered like a halide group. So both HF and HCN are weak acids. Oxo acids can also be weak acids, but here the oxygen atoms only outnumber the protons by one or they are equal in number. So examples of those are given here below. Finally, all carboxylic acids that have the COOH group, whether R is a proton or a big carbon group or a small carbon group, uh, these are all considered weak. And lastly, H2S is also another example of a weak acid because it can also partly dissociate in water. Arrhenius bases are recognizable because they often have the formula MOH, uh, where the subscript N can be one or two. And that's because the M metal here is usually a group one metal like sodium or potassium, or a group two metal like calcium or magnesium. Arrhenius bases also dissociate in water to lose a hydroxide ion. Uh, so for example, magnesium hydroxide can dissociate to form two equivalents of hydroxide and generate the magnesium two plus ion. Now like strong acids, strong bases also dissociate completely. So again, this reaction is indicated with just a right-hand arrow to mean that only the products are favored. So we also want to be able to recognize what strong bases are, and these are generally very limited in number. Um, they tend to have the formula um, MOH uh, with one or two, or MO uh, for both group one and group two metals. So for group one metals, this would be M2O to balance the O2 minus charge with two of group one metals, or just MO because the metal is plus two and the oxygen anion is two minus. So these are the only kinds of strong bases. And by definition, all Arrhenius bases are strong. Lastly, I'd like to talk about what happens when an Arrhenius acid is reacted with an Arrhenius base. 
The name of this reaction is just called neutralization. I like to think of it as annihilation. You have an acid and a base and they can annihilate each other so that overall you end up with a neutral solution. Here are two examples of Arrhenius acids reacting with a base. In the first example here, we have the strong acid HCl reacting with magnesium hydroxide. And the proton and the hydroxide ion basically combine to form water. And what we have left over are the remaining ions, the chlorides from HCl, and the magnesium 2 plus from the base. In this next example, we have a weak acid, one of the carboxylic acids, reacting with sodium hydroxide. And again, we do form water and also the corresponding ions such as acetate and sodium. So you'll notice in that both of these examples, we have a reaction with just a right-handed arrow, meaning that the product water and the ions are strongly favored. And this is a right-handed arrow because both of these reactions involve either or a strong acid or base. So as long as one of the participants is strong, these reactions are strongly driven to products. Another thing to notice in these reactions is that when you generate ions, some of these ions are what we call spectator ions. They do not generate any acid-base chemistry by themselves. So we'll go over this in more depth later on, but spectator ions are typically associated with strong acids or bases. Um, so hence, you can see that acetate, because it's associated with the weak acid, isn't actually a spectator ion, but the group 1, the group 2 metal cations, and chloride associated with HCl, these are all good examples of spectator ions. A later definition of acids and bases were proposed by Bronsted and Lowry. So because this definition came after Arrhenius' definition, oftentimes they are inclusive of what was already defined. And so for both Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, you can see that examples will include all the ones we had already talked about. Um, so all Arrhenius acids are also Bronsted-Lowry acids. Now, remember in the Bronsted-Lowry acid and base definition, this is proton-centric. So acids are proton donors and bases are proton acceptors. And proton acceptors all need a lone pair of electrons to do that. So you can see that that adds a little bit more definition. The reason why there's more protons is now um, we're not necessarily restricted to water. So water itself can donate protons and therefore it would be considered a Brownsted-Lowry acid. Um, and in the base examples, uh, previously the Arrhenius definition was very restrictive. It was basically restricted to group one and group two metal hydroxides. But now we have all these amine bases, like the ones I showed you in the building blocks of life, um, as well as some others, including water, um, because these all have a heteroatom, nitrogen, sulfur, or oxygen, with a lone pair of electrons that can accept a proton. So I won't go through what a strong or weak acid or strong base, um, how that react in water, because we just did that. But now we have to talk about these new bases, uh, which are considered weak. So what do weak bases do in water? So weak base example would be ammonia. And it's a base because ammonia has this lone pair of electrons shown in this blue cloud. And in water, ammonia can take a proton from water to form ammonium ion, NH4+. And when the proton is ripped away from water, that leaves behind 
hydroxide, OH minus. So being able to recognize weak bases is also important. Uh, so nitrogen molecules, where there's a lone pair on nitrogen, like ammonia or these amines, are all weak bases. So you'll notice that in all these examples, nitrogen is bound to three atoms. Our group is usually a carbon-based group, so it can have surrounded by three carbon groups, three protons, or some combination thereof. Uh, but because this lone pair is always present, all these amines and ammonia are weak bases. So thiolate, SH minus, or instead of a proton, if it's a carbon group, uh, these are also weak bases because they have lone pairs and they can accept a proton. Now, even if it's not anionic, if you have a lone pair, like in water or H2S, these are also possible weak bases. And finally, this is an interesting class down here below. Negative ions that are associated with weak acids. So for instance, fluoride is an ion that's associated with the weak acid HF. Um, this next example, RCOO minus, is the anion associated with a carboxylic acid. Because these all have lone pairs that can accept a proton to form the weak acid, these are also considered examples of weak bases. So like with acids, there's a lot more weak bases to keep track of than strong bases. Um, but all you have to remember is that it has to have a lone pair. With those definitions, you can relook at this reaction. And we had already called ammonia a base. But we can also think of water as an acid because what happens in this reaction is that water donates its proton to ammonia. And so you can think of an acid-base reaction as just a proton transfer. The proton moves from the acid to the base to form the protonated base and the deprotonated acid. So in general, most acid-base reactions can simply be thought of as a transfer of a proton, or H+. The weak base in water, you'll notice, has an equilibrium arrow. So this reaction moves forward, but it can also move backwards. And so if we were to start at the back end of this reaction, we can also think of the reverse reaction as being a proton transfer, where now the proton starts in NH4, and it gets transferred to OH-. And if that's the case, then we can label our product, NH4, as an acid, and our other product, OH-, as a base. And this brings up an interesting duality in that acid-base reactions beget acids and bases. Um, because when you transfer the proton, you turn that base into an acid, and also when the acid loses its proton, it turns into a base. And so the color coding here is to show the pairs of acids and bases that go together. And these have a special name. They're called conjugate acid-base pairs. And so the word conjugate just in the dictionary usually means that they are coupled, joined together, or operate as if they are joined. And so you can think of the proton transfer as a reaction to generate the conjugate acid and base of the reactants. So here, ammonia picks up a proton to generate its conjugate acid, while water loses a proton to generate its conjugate base. And so acids and bases are basically like two sides of a coin. Um, on one side, you have the acid form, and then you take away a proton, you flip to the other side of the coin, which is where the base is. All acid-base reactions have this general form where the reactants are an acid and base, 
and after proton transfer, the products are the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. So because conjugate acid pairs are so central to acid-base chemistry, you really want to be able to recognize them. And the most straightforward way to recognize an acid-base conjugate pair is to see that they differ by one proton. So here I have a carboxylic acid, and if I lose a proton, I form this anion, which is its conjugate base. And likewise, if I start here at the base and I add a proton, then I form its conjugate acid. Another example of a conjugate acid base pair is hydronium ion and water. And what's neat about water, it also has an ionizable proton that can be lost. And that forms the hydroxide ion. So water and hydroxide ion also form a conjugate acid base pair. So there's many examples of conjugate acid base pairs. Here we have ammonium, NH4 plus with ammonia or HF with fluoride. In this last example, this is an acid with two ionizable protons shown in red. And we can lose the first proton to generate this single ion where this is the conjugate base of the original acid. But because we again have the second acid available, we can again do a proton transfer to now generate this dianion, which is the conjugate base of the monoanion. And this last example here is HCl, which can lose a proton to generate chloride. Technically, this is not a conjugate acid base pair because chloride does not undergo the reverse direction. So chloride, remember, is a spectator ion, meaning it cannot pick up a proton to reform HCl. So unlike these other examples that are reversible, this is not a reversible reaction. Up to now, we've talked about strong acids versus weak acids, strong bases versus weak bases. And by far, the largest group are the weaks. So weak acids have many more examples than strong acids, and that's also true for bases. But within the large group of weak acids, they actually have varying strengths. And so you can see in this image here, we have the acids on the left side paired with their conjugate bases on the right side. And again, if we look at the middle section where all of the weak acids and bases are located, um, you'll see that there's quite numerous examples. But what is true is that the stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base. And so we have this inverse relationship where as the acid gets stronger, its conjugate base gets weaker. And vice versa, as bases get stronger, their conjugate acids are weaker. Another thing is we often talk about reaction direction. And for an acid-base reaction, the reaction direction always goes from the stronger acid and the stronger base to the weaker acid and weaker base. And so in this chemical equilibrium, it's the weaker base and acid that are favored as products. And so this reaction direction is shown as favoring the product side. So this kind of image on the right is useful when you're trying to predict in an acid-base reaction which side of the reaction is favored. On my last slide in this video, I want to revisit the oxal acid rule, which seems kind of arbitrary. Remember, these rules help you decide whether an oxal acid is strong or weak, and it has to do with the number of protons and the number of oxygens. So where does this rule come from? This is actually covered in section 18.5 in our textbook 
but it's not required. But in case you're wondering where this arbitrary rule comes from, it's actually very well rooted in um, thermodynamic stability. So I'd like to show you some examples of strong oxo acids. Here, the number of oxygens outnumber the number of protons by two or more. And when they undergo proton dissociation, these reactions favor the right, and they generate these anions shown here, which are actually very stable. And I'll explain that in a little bit. On the right side, we have the weak oxo acids because the number of oxygen atoms either outnumber the protons by one or are equal. And here, they also undergo dissociation, but by far it's not complete. Um, these reactions favor the intact acids, and they also generate anions, but these are considerably less stable than the ones for the strong acids. So what determines the stability of these anions? They all have a single minus charge. It actually has to do with the fact that charge on molecules generally is a bad thing. Um, it's a burden for these molecules to have to stabilize that extra charge, whether it's negative or positive. But sometimes in a molecule, there are ways in which that charge can be shared with other atoms. And here, all the oxygens in blue in these anions can share the charge from that O minus group. You can see that on the strong side, these anion products have more sharing because there's simply more blue oxygen atoms that can delocalize this O minus charge. But on the right side here, these anions only have one other blue oxygen to share that charge burden. And because there's fewer O atoms to share, it's not as stable as the anions in, on the left side. So basically, the more blue oxygen atoms in the product, the more charge is shared. And the more charge is shared, the more stable that anion is, which then makes it easier to form, and so the stronger the acid because the acid wants to go completely to the anion product if it is strong.